The veil is not just covering your body, but it's a veil from the world. It is all race, regardless yeah. whether you have a daughter who loves her parents and she gets mm -hmm. married, but it's not what she wants. It's still non-consensual, you know? They think that they own my body and what I do with my body and I have no right to show it. And, and I cannot be a true Afghan if I do this. So it's like I always get such messages like, oh, you're mm. faking it, you're Jewish. Hi, everyone. Welcome to I Hate Porn, the sex podcast from mctommy.com. Uh, this week, we've got a very special guest, Yasmina, who is a porn star that's from um, Afghanistan and has a Muslim background, which is very, very unusual in the porn industry. And Yasmina, really great to have you on. How are you? I'm doing really great. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I really can't <laughs> wait. I love the name of the podcast. I think it really, you know, <laughs> attracts a lot of attention, but I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's really uh, nice of you to think about me and to be able to have a platform where I can just share some experiences and maybe it will help some people out there or inspire them to also join the phone industry. Mm -hmm. Even if they hated it in the beginning, you never know. We can turn yeah. that hate relationship into a loved one. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really interesting. Just when I introduced you and like tried to sum things up, I always think it's maybe not so nice to define someone by their religion or where they're from, but it is just so unusual. Yeah. Um, and how, how did how do you feel about like that aspect of it? Do, I... do you think of yourself as a Muslim porn star, or do you think of yourself as just a porn star that happens to be from somewhere different? I think it's more this option number two, because I'm an atheist, you know, I used to be a Muslim mm -hmm. and then I left the religion. Yeah. Um, but I still think that a lot of people connect the two because as mm -hmm. you say, it is unusual, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had more Asian models, black models, Arab models, you know, just a mixture in the porn industry, especially in, in Central Europe or even in America, because I feel like maybe it's, there is not. Um, then there isn't enough representation, but I think it also has to do with people's backgrounds. There are not enough women um, maybe exploring their sexuality. So um, I don't know, when I started, I didn't really, I don't know, I didn't really use that term. Of course, I would, I, I, I posted every way, yeah, I'm Afghan, so what, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not ashamed of that. And it is my background. Yeah. It, I, I'm, I can't do anything about it you know i was born in this uh, uh country i was born in that environment it's only what i took from it you know what i learned from it even if it was tragic and then brutal oh. at times um but i would say that a lot of people still associate the two because i understand though why it's not that i'm against them calling me or oh, afghan porn star or porn model because i feel like i think i am the only one out there who is yeah, and when you were rare in porn, yeah. it's good marketing too. It's it's good to be, yeah. you know, the... It's hard to stand out in porn, you know. There's only so many yeah. ways you can take your clothes off or have sex. So, like, how old were you when you uh, left Afghanistan? Uh, when I left Afghanistan, I was nine years old. So, um, okay. I grew up during the um, Taliban regime. I saw them. I remember, you know, the parade um, mm -hmm. in Kabul. And I know it really... When you say the parade, what parade? Taliban do you mean? parade. You know, similar to what they did recently, what happened in summer. So they had, mm -hmm. when they took over the country in the 90s, um, they had a parade. So they would, um, like a military parade, but okay. with Toyota. So you remember you know? when they took over? <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember the images, though. I don't remember everything in detail, of course. Um, mm -hmm. This is just, you know, a long time ago, but I do remember the images and I remember the feeling that I. Um, sometimes, you know, you may not remember all the details, but you remember how you felt during that time. Yeah. And I never forgot that feeling. I felt like I was somewhere else. You know, I felt like I did not belong in that place. I felt really like, you know, you feel like you're in a surreal world and you cannot relate to what's going on and you are just going along with what everybody's saying. But you see this fight, this violence around you, and you are desensitized to it, and it just somehow doesn't affect you. But you're still wondering, like, this will be over soon. You know, that's how I felt. It was a so mixture. Even at a young age. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I would. Uh, that's how 
I felt during that time. And then uh, there was an opportunity, of course, to, to leave. And um, what I left in, it was in 2002. And the reason, I don't remember the year I left in, but I remember because my first school certificate that I received was from 2002. So that's okay. how I know it was around this year that I came to England because that was when I got my school certificate for yeah. trying. It really, literally had stickers on it. I still have it, which says <laughs> um, like uh, I had um, points for effort for learning English. So <laughs> that was, I, was, I was really proud yeah. of that certificate, you know, because I couldn't read or write before. We weren't allowed to as girls and women. My God, that's... It's, it's just incredible to just think that it, the, the difference is that stark. But I think you said a minute ago that there was a lot of violence around you and you get used to that. And I guess I was thinking that maybe the violence is kind of quite isolated and maybe not so common and most people are just living their lives, okay, maybe in a more strict way. But mm. there's just... But you said you're just surrounded by what sort of violence are you surrounded I'm talking by? About, I'm talking about, you know, I saw people being beaten up um, for not, you know, being religious and dressing appropriately in religious mm -hmm. attire. Also, I'm not just talking about violence against women, but also against young men, you know, for not wearing a beard, uh, having a beard like you're meant to in, in Islam. Um, it's recommended you have a beard as a man um, because that's what the Prophet did. So you kind of follow in his footsteps. So, um, that was uh, the level of violence, you know, you couldn't leave the house without a male chaperone and, uh, why should a woman leave unless it's an emergency, you know? So you are kind of hidden in, uh, as a, you're hidden actually from the world, you know, mm. your veil, literally the veil is not just covering your body, but it's a veil from the world. Um, and those are the small things. And it also calls to domestic violence. And you said um, that girls were obviously kept isolated at home. And I guess my first thought was that that sounds really unhealthy. Like it is. that you mustn't it is. get much exercise or sunshine or... Unhealthy in many regards. Um, and not just about physical health, but also mental health. Um, because mm. you are isolated from mixing with other genders and you are... You know, spending the entire time with your family. You know, mm. imagine now during lockdown, being locked up. I, know. I mean, this is a privilege, but you would go insane, you know? So imagine the impact it has on kids where you don't have, uh, you don't know how to read. So you cannot even busy, uh, be busy that way. You know, you cannot really, you don't have TV other than religious TV or radio. And that's it. So you don't have a normal childhood and it does impact you. It keeps you very, um, you know, full of fear, um, mm. and anxiety, you know, and that's why there are a lot of health, health mental health problems, you know, and when uh, you have refugees coming to Europe, you have to do a lot in order to help integrate them because, you know, you're dealing with damaged souls. Mm. Uh, the not reading thing, I, I guess I was a bit ignorant too, but I can't imagine how it must be to not be able to read like is the woman expected to do shopping for example and if she can't read how do you do it like just basic things you just do it without knowing how to read like you you know what you want to buy and it's not like you're shopping on the internet you know you go to the um, bazaar and you know okay you want some onions you might learn how to calculate that way you know some people mm. learn that way with um with practice um, but still you didn't have an education. Um, so you see, it, you see the, the, the holes in the um, knowledge. So a lot of the things that people know is through practice, you know, you know what you want to buy, how many kilos, how much it will cost you if you get a certain number of, uh, certain kilos of potatoes, for example. So those kind of things women do know is because they had no other choice, you know, you can adapt to the situation. Yeah. But you're not and reading yeah. a shopping list, you know, you you don't have a shopping list. You don't get a receipt. You yeah. Know? <laughs> but just, just remembering what you need to buy. To, like, yeah. You just have to do it all in your head. Yeah. It's... You have to do it all in your head. And, you know, I remember as a kid when we, when I had to go shopping with, um, 
my grandma and I was told, okay, you uh, make sure to get this, 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 this. And I made a mistake. So instead of getting meat, I got intestines. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So I had a bag full of intestines that I bought and we had guests and I was told, okay, what are we going to do with intestines? But because I couldn't remember what exactly was needed. And that was as a child. So mm. you can imagine um, how it feels for, for women more experienced. <laughs> yeah, and, and how common was it to actually beat people? You said you were surrounded by violence, but is it any more than say, I don't know, like a drunken part of a city center in England, they tend to be quite violent on a Friday or Saturday night, or is it, yeah, is I it think a daily occur occurrence or is it's it? It's a daily like occurrence. A I mean, the thing okay. with the, you know, uh, rowdy football fans in mm -hmm. the UK, you know, you have, they're under the influence of beer and you still have protection. It's not like everybody else is like, oh my God, I'm fearing for my life. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. these idiots again. You know, that's the kind of yeah. um, feeling you have and you call the police and they're taken away. And of course you keep your distance, um, but you can call somebody, you know? Yeah. There, you, the the people causing the violence is running the country. So mm. who are you going to call, you know? And you, you're you afraid, do you want your hand chopped off or not? So it's like people will still steal. So uh, this whole thing about preventing violence by being violent. So if they say, if you're violent and you steal, we will chop off your hands to prevent people from stealing, but it doesn't prevent because people will still steal. And you, there is only fear, a fear um, uh, mechanism, you know, to instill fear and make people afraid of going out and in order to make them follow and uh, obey and be obedient and submissive. Um, but it's like a daily occurrence. It's like from what you can sell in your shop to what you can listen to, how you can dress. So it's all aspect of your life. You, mm. you walk on the street and if they don't like you, let's say you have the wrong guy on the street with a baseball bat or a cane or an AK-47. Like, As you do. just eye contact just... alone might cause him to stop you and then get aggressive, you know? So it's like you're afraid. So violence, it's not like I'm saying that they're going around shooting everyone, but there's enough death. There are enough deaths um, that you see. And it starts with mental terror, you know, and that's mm. the strongest. Yeah, it does sound, I, I can't, I've been in situations where you feel intimidated and, you know, it lasts for maybe a few minutes. Yeah. I can't imagine having that feeling throughout the day or the week or the year. It, it's just incomprehensible to me, really. I think yes. to a lot of people. And, and you try to, yeah, and you just try to enjoy and living in the moment, you know, as you say, if it goes away, but you're kind of constantly confronted with it and you kind of accept mm -hmm. it and you try to, you, you will still see kids laughing and playing and having fun, even though they have literally nothing. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's surprising how much fun you can have with nothing, though. I think yeah. <laughs> there is, <laughs> yeah, mental state is definitely not all about wealth. That's true, um, yeah. But it's again interesting, just like, why do you think they target women so much? You know, it's this, it comes to religions, you know. Uh, Abrahamic religions have a problem with the female body, with f women, you know. Uh, you see all, a lot of, it's all, all the rules when you look at them, it's not, it's only for men's advantage and pleasure, you know. If you're on your period, you're considered uh, unholy, Dirty, you know, when you think about it, without women, there would be no, you know, human race. But it's, yeah. they have a problem with female sexuality because they're afraid of losing control. The whole idea is based on controlling and subjugating women. And that can only happen if they're not educated, if they're stupid, if they're, you know, just following um, mm -hmm. without questioning everything. And the moment they, you give them education, you give them resources, they will threaten the status quo. And they don't want that, you know, they enjoy the power. It's about this. Those men love the power. And that's what it comes to. Of course, there is no justification for any of this. It's just all barbaric caveman mentality. 
but uh-huh. um, that's the reason. It's about the power, the control you have over somebody. And do you think it actually works, or do you think people just live their lives as just in private, in secret? Like they they do all the things that maybe Westerners would do, but just they have to keep quiet about it. I think there is a mixture. I think it works on many people. And then you have people, if you look at in, uh, the situation in Iran, people are still maybe underground, uh, do underground parties, uh, uh-huh. have fun, dance. And the same in Afghanistan, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. You know, there are people out there who are like uh, one way of dealing with stress or maybe rebelling against the system. Uh, uh-huh. But the majority are trapped like all of them are trapped but the majority will follow you know that's the problem and if there was a strong resistance against this we wouldn't be in this place in the first place but you have people who genuinely believe in these things they believe that women shouldn't have rights that the men and women should dress a certain way behave a certain way and this wouldn't exist if there was what if there, if it was a minority. But unfortunately, they have a lot of power. If you even look at Europe, you know, the, in the countryside, the older generation ruining it for the younger people. There is like a thousand times worse. So mm-hmm. that's what it is. That's what and I think, think it is. And do you think the Taliban practice what they preach, for example, or do you think if you have the power, you can ignore the rules? Because one of the things I was mm. looking at before we spoke is yeah. um, I was just looking at porn specifically and and it wasn't just with the Taliban, for example. So um, obviously Bin Laden, um, who was not in the Taliban, um, he was found like in his compound, he had a huge porn collection when they found him. <laughs> um and I've seen that that's quite common with ISIS fighters as well. Um, that I think they said 80% had huge troves of porn on their laptops when they found them. Um, and I think similar there's similar stories about the Taliban. So I wasn't sure if that's... <laughs> I mean, that's a really great conversation right now. Uh, <laughs> but continue, please. I just have some thoughts that I would like to share afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's the, the question really is just do, it, like, do, do, the, do the leaders and the people in power in these places, do they practice what they preach? I wouldn't believe them because sometimes they don't practice what they preach. Um, I would say, I don't know about OBL, you know, um, Osama bin Laden. I'm not sure if this mm-hmm. was really the case that they found him with this. I don't know. It just kind of yeah. seems like a setup to me. Um, but it sounds convenient, aside, doesn't it? Sounds very convenient, you know. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised because sexually repressed societies are kind of obsessed. You know, when you look at the um, when you look at where most of the viewers come from for when it's related to visiting websites like Pornhub, etc. You see most of them are from Middle Eastern countries or from maybe even North Korea, who knows, from <laughs> India, for example. And these societies are very sexually repressed and yep. it's like a medium for them, you know, it's like they can it's like it's human nature, you know, but they're trying to repress this human nature. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised that they, I'm sure they are, there are those out there who really, you know, are, I would say, um, attracted, not attracted, but, you know, uh, kind of enticed by sexuality, but are afraid maybe to, or it doesn't, um, this is a conflict of their inner self against their society, against their righteous self, you know? Mm -hmm. But you I could imagine is, them yeah. watching some porn and then feeling guilty afterwards. For example. Maybe, yeah. Like, oh my God, it's this is the reason why I hate it all. You know, this is what they're making me do. You know, it's like yeah. uh, this loathing, self-loathing. Um, I think they go into this. I'm not sure what the Taiwan leaders knew because I have no clue. You know, I don't keep tabs on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you still imagine have, that? <laughs> do you, are you in touch with anybody in Afghanistan now? No, and I don't want to be, you know? No. That's the thing. Um, I, I think most of uh, Afghans who visit my sites, like, they are mostly hating. 
um, my content because they, they don't want Afghanistan to be known for porn. They don't want to have a, an Afghan woman. Like, how dare I show my body, you know? Like, mm-hmm. they own me. That's the thing. They think that they own my body and what I do with my body, and I have no right to show it. And and I cannot be a true Afghan if I do this. So it's like I always get such messages like, oh, you're mm-hmm. faking it. You're Jewish. You are undercover, you know, and I'm like, Hey, I'd love to play this act. You know, it would be great. Like we should get an Oscar for that, but this is too real, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's a very nationalistic message. Like to yeah, just have this idea that somehow every Afghan is representing the country, the nation. And yeah, it is. You, right. It's the same. I think in many cultures, um, just this idea that somehow they're our women, uh, they belong to us somehow. And this is exactly how they, uh, the message that they're, they're um, trying to, to, uh, to show the world. And this is why, you know, I am unabashed when it comes to uh, saying I'm Afghan. I am Afghan, so I think what? You know, and yeah. I know that maybe there are Taliban out there who are watching my content. Who knows? I'm sure they've heard of me. Like, I'm, I won't be surprised. Just write Afghan porn and you'll find me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good to own that word, though. <laughs> yeah, you will find it on Pornhub and all the other sites. Just write those two words and you will see my name. <laughs> yeah, I, I read also that um, now the Taliban are back in power, that they're searching for sex workers online um, in order to kill them or... Um, I guess there's, there may be more. They, they said they're searching like porn sites. But I don't know if it's like a real story or just the media whipping up some sensation. Um, um, so I feel like you can write almost anything about the Taliban and it sounds believable. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't know, I don't know about the Afghan... sex workers. I'm not sure yeah. either. I mean, in general, they are going from one place to the next to uh, attack journalists. You know, they killed a lot of journalists uh, in mm. the past couple of years. And anyone who is a, an influencer, you know, uh, who's showing yeah. their face on in, on Instagram and you see a lot of the Afghan, uh, either male or female, who are basically kind of breaking taboos, uh, they have either deleted their account or changed it or gone on private. Um, I even saw this with a known journalist. So I was like, it's because she's afraid, you know, so they're in hiding and even people escaped photographers, the creatives have left for other countries like Iran, or if they were lucky, they left for, I don't know, Italy, Germany, uh, if they have already helped there, but a lot of people don't have the help. And I'm not sure. I can't say I'm, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Every country has uh, sex workers. This is like the yeah. oldest trade um, that we have, I would say. And I wouldn't be surprised. And of course, they're threatened by it, you know. Um, now with social media, with sites like OnlyFans, you know, all you need is internet and a phone. And that's mm-hmm. it. And you can make money that way. And they don't want this, you know. Of course not. But they'd rather trade in heroin. So it's like... Yeah. <laughs> which they one can is sell worse? heroin, but they... And, and yeah. also, there's, there's so many contradictions. Like... Um, forcing a woman to marry one of their fighters like for me a forced marriage is you know a a bigger sexual crime than you know filming some porn like how does consent work in in the taliban world or is it in islam in general thing or Mm, it actually depends from region to region um I think that's a really good question. I don't think you can, you cannot compare the two, you know, like shooting porn with, uh, forced marriage because, yeah. um, it's like even in India, you know, they use the word arranged marriage, arranged, mm-hmm. uh, instead of forced marriage, but it is still forced. You know, you're put into this box and you have to kind of get along. And it's like, what, what if you don't, you know, what are the consequences? I, I guess when I'm saying forced marriage, um, so yeah, there's forced arranged marriages, but I'm thinking of um, where they're literally just taking girls and forcing them to marry a fighter. Um, and from like 
I'd say that's more like rape. Um, it is way. rape. It is all rape, it's, regardless yeah. whether you have uh, a, a daughter who loves her parents and she's like, yeah, we'll marry whoever you want me to. And she gets mm -hmm. married, but it's not what she wants. It's still non-consensual, you know? Yeah. One is more violent, maybe, you know, the girl who is snatched yeah. and, you know, beaten up and told what to do by the fighter compared to, but in the end, it doesn't, uh, the damage is the same, you know, the, you're right. You break somebody's soul and you, it's to humiliate them. Uh, whether it's in one setting or the other, uh, there is the, con the, the concept of consent doesn't really exist in Afghanistan. As an example, I, I would say it's in other countries too. It's like you, your duty is to obey your husband. And if mm -hmm. you disobey, then according to Islam, according to the Quran, if you disobey your husband, he has the right to beat you. Mm -hmm. There is a surah, there is an exact phrase, and no matter how many people try to sugarcoat this, you cannot sugarcoat domestic violence. And that's all you need to know about how women are treated in Islam. No matter mm -hmm. if they have a bit more rights compared to other religion or whatever, you know, in the end, it's all the same shit, just a different hole, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it in Afghanistan too. So I remember when I first asked this question, I asked my mother this question and she was like, there is no such thing as rape. What? Yeah. She told me this. She said there is no such thing as rape in Islam and not in Afghan society because you cannot disobey your husband. If he says, yes, now is the time, then you obey. It's your duty, you know? Mm. And the consequences are either you will be beaten up or mentally terrorized, who knows? But you, you kind of maybe don't want to find out the consequences. So you kind of give in and you allow this, well, not allow, but this happens to you. Mm -hmm. It's sort of kind of not in your control, but it's like, it's a, it's a terrible situation to be in. And I wonder what, like what a, I guess you don't know because you moved, but like what's like a typical Afghan's sexuality like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think everyone has a different sexuality i don't think there is like an umbrella for it mm. um I, and i always I think th there's patterns with how we you know like things that we experience through our life they kind of mm. we like maybe have these kind of patterns so i guess i was thinking in that perspective no no i understand what you mean i just feel like maybe it's not i don't know i think you cannot really um compare it you know everybody has mm -hmm. a different experience there might be somebody in Afghanistan who loves the Taliban, who is not like, hey, I'm proud of my sexuality, you know, whatever, whatever. You may have those kind of Stockholm Syndrome patients. Mm -hmm. And then you have somebody like me. So it's like, it's a wide range, but I don't yeah, think yeah. you can really, in such, a, in such an environment, you cannot really know much about your sexuality. Yeah, that's true. Because you cannot really explore it, you know. And there are LGBT members who are, scared you know they know uh who they are what they you know they know about their sexuality but maybe they don't have that much experience but they know about it um but they cannot really explore it because it would mean they will end up dead um i just, just think dead. this yeah just <laughs> dead basically um i just think that there is no stereotypical the stereotypical is i would say what you could call is from the outside it's the typical uh, cisgender heterosexual relationships and that's mm -hmm. it and and it's sort of like the man is the breadwinner of the family he tells you what to do and you obey have kids you're a baby machine and you it's not like your orgasms matter you know why should you masturbate or any of this it's like you open yeah. your legs you get fucked by your husband Whenever he comes, that's it. You get up and you continue doing the housework. So that's <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. No, no cuddles. <laughs> no cuddles. But you're not. Like there's no for and after play. Literally. I doubt it. I doubt it. That's yeah, why I it's think, so damaged the relationships between the children. I think without that sexual 
culture of magazines and websites and sex teachers. Because um, when I speak to much older people, I think the yeah. sex lives of younger people, just in the West, like we were a lot more conservative back then. I think a lot of women and men went through life not really knowing what good sex was. I think it's just yeah. if you maybe explored it yourself, you knew. But generally, I, I don't think like in the 50s, you got very sexual articles like you do in magazines like from the 60s onwards. So yeah. it's definitely interesting from that point of view. Yeah, for sure. I think we're, as a society, we're more open now. Uh, there are certain mm. times where I'm like, mm, we're not that open as I thought we would be, you know? Um, you don't have that many nude beaches compared to before. You know, it's just like there are good things and bad things. Um, but I think here we are so much freer. You, you can mm. do whatever you want, basically. And it's like the prison that you have, you've built yourself. There you have a cage that's been put like you've been put in the cage here yeah. we build our own cages more it's more this actually yeah, yeah. whether it's from the media or whatever but it's more our own doing and so um how, how did how did you develop sexually um in this conservative environment did you i guess at nine you probably weren't exposed to sexuality much as a nine-year-old, like uh, from, no. I, I was exposed at about eight. Mm. Um, that was when my parents started teaching me about sex. They bought me like a book mm. that had cartoon images in it. Um, and because I'd mentioned sex from, you know, someone's older brother at school, yeah. and I didn't know what I was talking about. I just used the word. Well, they mm. thought, okay, let's buy him this cartoon book. <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. Did, was there anything like that or from friends or family members? Um, no. no. Um, it, it's a, you know, I come from a very religious conservative backwards society. So there is no conversation about how you're feeling and um, not even really a conversation about when you start your period. It's like, okay, you started your period, here are the paths, and there is literally no conversation about your, men, your, uh, your health reproductive health this is just that as this is not even related to sex yeah. you know um so if there's no conversation about this you know how to groom yourself properly and you just kind of learn as you go by mm -hmm. yourself um and that, i remember the first time i really learned about sex was during school um sex education <laughs> this and was in it, england yeah it was in england yeah. i think i was probably I don't know, 10, I would say I was in yeah. year five, 10 or 11. I think that's when it starts. Yeah. And that's when they had the, so a lot of the Muslim, um, families signed letters to the school saying yeah. that they don't, it's just the stereotypical bullshit, you know, it's always mm. this bullshit that they do, which deny their children of education and just expo exposure and to explore their sexuality, you know, and ask questions and grow up properly, um, they repress their sexuality um, by saying, oh, it's too early to learn about sex. You know, all this BS that they mm -hmm. do when kids already explore, they se start exploring their sexuality at this age. And, you know, they can Google things. And would you rather your child Google or would you rather them have somebody in a classroom coming over and talking about all these things? Yeah, I know which one I would say yes to, you know? Yeah, the so, same people that say no to else, sex education, they always seem to say no. They always are against porn too, but it's that's what their it's kids are watching the if they don't suspects. give them one. Yeah. They watch a lot of porn and that's how they know, you know, and they feel guilty and maybe, I don't know, they kind of um, project their insecurities on their children. Um Maybe, yeah. Uh, but I remember, you know, that a lot of the kids were, yeah, Muslim kids were taken out of the classroom because, yeah, the parents didn't want them to, and I, I must have forgotten about it. You know, somehow, I ended up in the classroom, and I was like, you know, I didn't get the the letter because I was just, it wasn't on my mind, and then I mm -hmm. realized, oh, now it's the class. It's too late. Yeah. I'm sitting in the get classroom. The <laughs> Oh my God, I actually did not get the popcorn out, but I was like, okay, I was like, okay, I turned my back to the, to the screen. And then I was like curious. So I was like, oh, to hell with it. So I just oh, wow. turned okay. around 
<laughs> I turned around and I watched a woman giving birth. And I was like, holy yeah. shit. <laughs> I don't know I what to give I wonder if we saw the same video. Like, I wonder. Well, the video did we I saw see? It was so dis- Like sex education at like 10 or 11 years old. It was like yeah. once a week for about six weeks. And it was just a documentary, basically, that was made yeah. a very long time ago. <laughs> and it was... It was terrible. But it yeah, it was more like about that. where it's, babies come from rather than sex education, I felt. It was more about where babies came from, exactly. Yeah. And um, there was a woman, you know, she was in the, ba- uh, in the bed and she gave birth and the baby was coming out. And then she, you know, I think we watched the same video because I think they really used the same video. How I'm many sure. actors? How many actors are you going to find who give birth like this on camera, you know? <laughs> when social media wasn't really that up and coming back then um but yeah i watched it and i was so disgusted i was literally disgusted i could see you know Mm -hmm. the it was just wet and it was so disgusting and it was like oh my god i don't want to be in that position like that was like i always said okay maybe i'll have kids but it was sort of something i was taught but when i think about kids i think about that moment and i'm like i do not want to be in labor i don't want to look like that i don't want to this happening to my body so it was like an instant rejection of Mm -hmm. what i'm expected to be um so that was like my first and also seeing a naked body and i was like i don't know i just felt like i didn't feel anything i was just like i'm disgusted and that's everything okay this is what i'm afraid of or you know like i didn't tell anyone nobody knew that i actually was in the sex ed class because I was like, holy shit, imagine if somebody finds out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll get in trouble. Um, so instead of having this conversation, I just pretended like it was a normal day at school, nothing happened, you know. Well, so um, if people found out you were in sex education classes, it would get back to your parents or something? Yeah, uh, if they, if, um, yeah, it would actually, uh, because it, let's say if the kids are talking or the teacher and, you know, it's sort of, um, like, why are you interested in about sex ed? Look, she's already horny and she wants to have sex and, you know, she, wow, maybe we get so her married. It's so gossipy, literally. It's so wow. gossipy. And it's about your own kid, you know? So it's like, in order to prevent that from happening, a lot of girls also get married earlier, child marriages, you know? It's a way to control the women as well and get Even rid of them. in the West? In way. Not in the West, though, I guess. In the West, too, you know, when you are uh, taken on holiday, holiday, mm-hmm. uh, let's say you're 12 or 13 years old or let's say 15 or something and you go on holiday and for summer you're married, Islamically, legally you're not married, you know? So, okay. but you're still married and then the process starts and you have to bring your husband or you know that's how it's how it is for a lot of women too that's is that common or is that unusual i would say it's uh i think it's sort of like you know uh, the um, i wouldn't say it's unusual i knew many girls who were married off like wow. you hear it ah uh, this cousin she was you know not wearing the hijab properly and she was smoking she was caught having a boyfriend and now she's married or has a fiance and then when you talk with those girls it's like they they portray and i remember this one girl you know i heard this about her that she was caught having a boyfriend and now she's has a fiance and i remember i don't know who it was and not a cousin but somehow friends of friends or whatever your yeah, family friends and i met her and she was like yeah, I'm, I have a fiancé now and I can't wait to get married. And in my head, I was like, I heard all these things about this girl. And here she is looking forward to getting married to some weirdo she doesn't even know from Afghanistan. I don't know. I just felt the what I heard about her didn't match what she was telling me. You know, she, I felt like she was lying to me. And I think she was, was probably she? 16 or something, 16 or 17. Wow. Well, I guess... I remember around that age when people were kind of first getting like real boyfriends and girlfriends. Yeah. That there were girls that were like, oh, he proposed to me, we were engaged. And, you know, they'd have like a crappy ring. And, yeah. But, you know, I felt it was more like just playing at being adults, you know. There is an appeal to that for young girls and guys. You know, when you're 
at that age. I think it's appealing to like kind of act more like an adult. But you are just acting for sure. It's, it's yeah, you're just acting. You have basically. no idea of consequences and and that was like work. a punishment, you know, of dealing with yeah. you being Western and you have to now accept this husband and anyway. So that was like what I what I saw and. Um, if you had gone back to my parents, if they knew about it, then they would be like, why am I interested in all these things? And maybe mm. I'm corrupted already. And the devil has taken over me. So, um, and you that would be the first. Yeah. That. You were yeah, aware, aware of that though. And could, were smart enough to keep it secret. I was so aware that's... of it. I was like, you know, uh, whatever I'm doing, uh, I always follow the rules, you know, it's not like I broke the rules most of the time. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a boyfriend. I didn't have sex. I didn't have these things, um, but there were certain things that I didn't tell because I was like, it's just going to cause unnecessary discussions and I don't mm. want to have fights and I don't want to get beaten up. Um, so I was aware of it. I knew exactly. So I was trying to be very careful um, for my own health. <laughs> yeah. And that's beaten up by classmates or like... Oh, uh, no, by like... my family, by my family. I don't mean my classmates. Like if they knew, they would have maybe, you know, this has happened before, slapping me or hitting mm. me with uh, an object, um, humiliating so meaning. Yeah. But those days are long gone. <laughs> yes. And so did you, it sounds like you changed very quickly when you got to the UK. So if you were you came at nine and by 10 having sex education and can read and write yeah. and you learn to read and write fast. So yeah, like I would say, because I was so hungry, you know, you know, when you're denied something, you want it mm -hmm. even more. Like you're like, there's, yeah. there's a world in here that I'm being denied and I want to know what it is. I want to know for myself. And for me, that's why, what really motivated me. So every day I would really try hard to read and just understand things. And I remember when I was in the school play and I would say, I, I only had one word to say, and I was so mm -hmm. proud of myself because I was like, I said one word in English in oh. a play. I was the angel and the word was himself. And I forgot it on stage, but then the teacher was like, <laughs> himself. And I was like, okay, himself. But I was so proud of that moment. And that was like the first year that I was in school. And, um, yeah, it was really, really nice. I was, I think I really integrated fast because I saw it was normal, you know, mm -hmm. you, you are treated with respect, you know, there was curiosity and people asked me about my scarf, like, what is it? Do you shower with it? You know, just those kind of things, but it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like they were attacking me. It was more yeah, yeah. coming from curiosity. Uh, when they asked questions, there were those people who did, like they called me the Taliban, but I think because they didn't know what it meant, it's not because they yeah. were like, they hated me. They were just like, they've never seen a girl who mm -hmm. cannot speak English, who's from a country where there's war and she's wearing a headscarf. I was the only girl in school with a headscarf. So I was yeah. like, I usually don't want to be the first in many places, <laughs> but that was like, I felt like, you know, when you are, when you, you, you know, that the whole point is not to attract attention with the scarf, but you attract attention. Yeah, it's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I, I've, I kind of find it quite sexy when I see, like, a pretty girl wearing one of those scarves. So it's like, just it, it's the mystery of it. It's exotic, yeah. and so yeah, it definitely attracts attention. I think. I've used it in porn videos, the, head, the headscarf. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I think a lot of people have a fetish, you know, just to, you know, they're like so sensual and so modest. And at the same time, you know, you want to know more well, about it. There's a Czech company that... Um, oh, yeah, just, you told me about this. Yeah, they, yeah I've they, seen the videos. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're so bad, aren't they? So they... they <laughs> Oh my like God. just regular white European <laughs> porn stars in a hijab and I should apply there literally because yeah. I think I would really help with the image <laughs> <laughs> I, no it's really strange right it. a Czech yeah. company does this and I love it you know I really really it's love really it it's really popular really really popular you have to send me so. the link again maybe I'll write to them and uh, when I go to 
Czech Republic that yeah. maybe I, I show with them. Um, it would be really fun just to, you know, have a very authentic uh, sex and image <laughs> being portrayed. So. Because I do find it weird. You know, when I saw that with like all white women, I was like, oh, okay, you can have converts too in Islam, but it's like, yeah. it's not the stereotype of what you know. Yeah. It just looks slightly wrong somehow, especially because you recognize the women from other porn <laughs> yeah. videos. <laughs> so it's like, you're not really Muslim, I know. <laughs> it's hard to find. That's the thing. You know, how many women do you know from Muslim backgrounds? Uh, in Whether porn, yeah. I know three. And, and you're it. one of them. Yeah. There are only three of us. I mean, no, there four. Is. I know four. And it's four. A, and it's a Kate, I think. She's okay, maybe five, Algerian. No, five, Algerian. No. I think she has Algerian background. Then there was Nadia Khan, but I think she quit porn. American, Pakistani. But yeah. um, that was number two. And then, okay, me and Sahara Knight. I think yeah. uh, I know her from, from Twitter. I haven't met her, but I've seen her work. And so Kira the, Queen as well. She's from Dag uh, yeah, Dagestan. What you yeah. told me. So five of yeah. us. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. Plus converts, maybe at the Czech Plus, site, they all convert before converts. they... <laughs> but it's so easy to convert to Islam. Just say the Shahada, you know, the declaration of faith and you're Muslim. Oh, cool. So I'll if you ever in find yourself in a hostage situation, just do this finger and learn this by heart and just say, you know, pretend you're Muslim and maybe you might be I hope lucky. I'm never in that situation. <laughs> I, a friend of mine was... Um, oh, my, no ex her brother was kidnapped in um in yemen oh no and it, shit. it didn't end well he was a journalist and oh shit yeah i'm so sorry to hear that sorry if i yeah no no, it's, no no it was just crazy because you don't expect someone you know to be kidnapped out there yeah but yeah but maybe this helps just a tip <laughs> Yeah, I hope it works. I hate porn. <laughs> Tip number one. How, to, how to escape a hostage situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. So we got as far as sex education yeah. when it was younger. Um, and did that have an impact on you? Did it make you think about sex? Did it make you desire sex? Or one of the things we spoke about mm. in the first episode was all about masturbation and... Um, the girl that we were talking to, she spoke about how she had a lot of shame around masturbation, but did it anyway. Um, and was it the same for you? Did you just slowly discover things? Or I would say masturbation was by accident that I discovered by it accident. in the bathroom. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this feeling is nice. And then there was that feeling of shame. Like you're like, uh -huh. oh, should I be even doing this? Like you, I think I did it maybe as a child a few times. Mm -hmm. And that was it. It was just, I can I can only re recall a few instances. And that was all. And I didn't have any desires like, oh, I will sleep with this guy or I want to have sex with somebody. Or I just put everything in a box and you kind of lock. You lock the box and you throw away the key and you just move on with your life. Yeah. So it's like functional, like just yeah. purely internal. You're I not just, fantasizing while you do that. Yeah, I just basically turned off the light, you know, just, it's like a switch. Mm -hmm. I call it the switch <laughs> <laughs> and I can still do it to this day. I can literally, for me, it's like being on set and offset. I can turn on the switch in mentally and I'm turned on and like, I'm there. That's the world I'm in and I'm having fun. And in the moment, mm -hmm. the moment the camera stops, that moment is over. Yeah. You, a lot of people find this hard because I always get this question, you know, uh, from people like, how do you do this? Are you always turned on? Do you always have sex? Like, how is this for you? Are you sexually attracted to the guy? I'm there. I'm turned on because I, 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 I control me turning on myself, mm -hmm. you know, and that's it. And light off. So, um, light off. I know that's so wrong. <laughs> an allergy but when i was a kid for me it was like the masturbation was like a switch and then i was in that moment and then it was gone and i didn't think about it it was like yeah. i move on every day and you lock the key and you throw away the key and that's how i felt and yeah. for me it was like that box it's like the pandora's box you know i didn't 
go near it again after these feelings of shame and you know you're like should i be doing this and then you kind of stop and you move on with your life and you have other things to worry about but it was this box pandora's box was there but you don't go near the box cuz you know yeah. when you open that box you don't know what you'll find out about yourself that you might be afraid then to hide you cannot hide it anymore yourself so it was like a battle it's an it mm. a battle yeah Is with my demons yeah yeah I, I just again it's so hard for me to understand but um even a lot of western people i've spoken to have said that they had similar like battles with the shame and whether it's a masturbation or with like having lots of partners um there's always like this feeling of oh should i be doing this is it yeah. right is it okay yeah and yeah getting to this point where you just think okay yeah i can do whatever i want and if it makes me happy it's good yeah it it's a long journey how did you get there oh wow that's a really long good question um i think you know the box was closed the pandora's box you know and then years mm-hmm. later there was a moment in my life when i just left and i could explore myself you know just everyday kind of stuff not having to wear the head scarf you know going out feeling the wind in my hair are uh, you just left the religion uh the religion mean, came or... later just leaving okay. the environment i mean just leaving okay. home it wasn't mm-hmm. really home but let's call it home for now leaving the place where i grew up in Mm-hmm. escaped i would say it was more of an escape actually um escaped and then you are wondering okay now I'm free what do i do like you have to find mm-hmm. you are no you don't have anybody telling you to do this and that and behave this way dress this way and you are you either continue with what you were brainwashed with or taught mm-hmm. and you don't change anything but you're still trapped by the past or you fight against it and you start questioning things. So mm-hmm. first thing was just with my routine, the way I dress and the way I eat. And then it came to sexuality because this was the one topic I did not touch because I was afraid, I would say. And I couldn't masturbate. I couldn't have an orgasm. And I was just like trying so hard because I was like something's mm-hmm. wrong with me, you know? <laughs> I kind of you take out the box, you try to unlock it, but the is the wrong key you know and i was so focused on achieving the end result because i thought the only way is okay a healthy sexual life is you have an orgasm yeah and that's what it is yeah that was the wrong idea of sexuality first of all and also it's not like uh start the engine and you know it's not like a and uh, meeting ends especially uh, for girls. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So I really was I went I, I saw it from a mechanical aspect, you know. I was yeah. like, okay, now I just rub use all the toys and nothing happened. Literally, I was not having an orgasm. And I was wondering and I felt bad and I was like, what's wrong with me? Something's not right. Like I've tried all the methods. <laughs> <laughs> But this I, is how guys <laughs> feel, really, when we're with a girl and it's like <laughs> Why is yeah. nothing I do working? <laughs> and it's yeah, for the more pressure way. you put on, it's yeah, the it less the likely it is. Yeah. Because you're like you're so rigid, you kind of let go because you're so focused on meeting the of of trying to achieve the result mm-hmm. that you forget the process and your body cannot your mind cannot relax because you're so focused on okay, I need to have an orgasm, orgasm. Nothing happened. And then, you know what? I was just like, okay, I'm too tired of this. I'm fuck it like sorry for my language to hell it's with okay. all of this i'm not going to give i'm not going to put any more effort into this i'm just going to whatever like i was so done with it literally i even once cried i was like this is Aww. so <laughs> i was like this is so fucked up like every idiot can have an orgasm <laughs> but not me <laughs> that's the way i saw it and then mm-hmm. i was like okay to hell with all of this and then Next thing you know there was a woman and that was turned on in a moment and I was like oh my god okay I didn't have any like routine okay let me get yep. a machine so then I orgasm but it took me months actually to have an orgasm literally believe it or not it literally took me months I I understand that and I... that first moment was like oh wow like now I get it you know now I know what okay. it means <laughs> now we're awake <laughs> that was like 
10 years later, my last orgasm was probably 10 years before. So it was like <laughs> a long wait. And, um, yeah. but it really was a good mode. It, I would say that orgasm was the trigger for a lot of things because <laughs> it helped me to just relax and just explore myself. And then I was like, uh, was like, okay, I want to be more confident. I want to find out more about sexuality, started reading more about it. And I came across, you know, uh, so my husband, David, you know, he does photography and I knew he did new mm -hmm. photography. So I would, so I decided, okay, I make a Twitter and I will just like his postings. It's not like I'm there posting my own stuff. So mm -hmm. then I would see all these beautiful, confident women. And I was like, Hey, wow, they're so beautiful and stunning. Like, I would love to, you know, when I saw his photos, I was like, I would love to also be in, have such photos taken of me. So I was, yeah. I was like, okay, now it's before he will, he never asked me to take photos of me, you know, if I wanted to, because he didn't want to make me feel like, okay, I have to or so. And, uh, but I, I told him, look, I want to. And, uh, he did it and I was really like surprised by the photos. So this is how it slowly started. And then I was like coming across Twitter accounts and other websites. And I was like, Hey, what if I just try some webcaming? Anyway, I was always afraid of it in the beginning. You know, I didn't That's really show That's a very me. brave thing for a young conservative girl to do, to yeah. just suddenly <laughs> dive into that. Well, you went know, from just like zero to ten really fast <laughs> it was no but it, for me it felt like an eternity because i was like i didn't have a routine i don't have anything i had all the time to myself mm -hmm. and i will never forget and i'm always grateful for this time because i feel like if you could have a year of your life or at least half a year just for yourself you have no responsibilities no nothing it really helps you to grow you know and get a perspective so yeah. this is where I, ha I had that time, you know, to deal with a lot of, you know, issues. <laughs> there were a lot and they were all dealt with. Um, but it was, it wasn't like overnight. It was like me literally putting in a lot of effort, mental energy mm -hmm. into this. And, um, uh, it felt for me like an eternity. It didn't feel like, oh my God, six months ago I escaped. I didn't feel this way. Um, for me, it was like a long time ago I went. Like today, when I think about it, it's more than eight years ago that I left. But for me, it feels like all my life, like it was 20 years ago that I left. I don't know. It yeah. feels longer. The years are longer in my, in my experience. Yeah. I feel like when we look at the past that it doesn't feel like us. It feels like you're looking at your cousin's life or something like that. It, I never feel like the same person I was that long ago. It's, it's a strange feeling. Yeah. I understand that completely. And that's exactly how it felt, yeah. And do you think that there was an element of rebelling against, like, your upbringing, the background, in the same way that, like, there's a stereotype of, say, Catholic schoolgirls being, you know, promiscuous and a bit wild? I would say I've always been this way, you know? When mm -hmm. I think about it, all those instances, I've always been being a very sexual person mm -hmm. like even if i didn't realize it you know as a kid you know um i knew the effect i have on people you know i kind of knew it but i didn't go too much into it because then you start dealing with other questions but yeah. i would say deep down i've always been this way it's just that i you know it's like a caterpillar who turned into a butterfly you always knew you were beautiful even as a caterpillar so mm -hmm. it's now you can only fly that's the difference um the colors are still there. You just really don't realize it. And, um, I wouldn't say it was a, like, I know a lot of, there are people who ask me this question and they're like, is it, you're only doing this is because you're, it's like rebellion, you know? Yeah. I've always been a rebellious person. My, 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 my instinct tells me to be against something that tries to repress me. Mm -hmm. And I love breaking taboos. I love, Everything that I love being, I love provocation. I love breaking taboos. I love blasphemy. I love all these things because mm -hmm. I feel like this is one way of standing up against this and also just being uh, in tune with my body because it's my choice, my body, my choice. A lot of people forget that it's also about this. It's not just about what you wear, but it's about 
you know, having sex, who you have sex with, how you have sex on camera, off camera, whatever. Um, it's, it's who I've always been. Um, some people call it rebellious. Other people call it like I've been taken over by the demons. Uh, it's just, uh, you others know, call it freedom. <laughs> others call so it think. freedom. So, <laughs> so yeah. it depends on who you ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing that keeps popping into my mind is, um, from the beginning when you said that people get beaten in the streets for just wearing Western clothes. And all I was thinking is you have to really admire their dedication to just wearing whatever the fuck they want, despite yeah. the consequences. Yeah, that's it. It is courageous, actually. Yeah, you've got to really, really want to wear jeans to, you know, oh, I don't know what's clothing yeah. band, but No, really, yeah, that's the thing, you know. And you incredible. see it in, if you Google White Wednesday, uh, also on Twitter, you will see lots of Iranian women walking on the streets. You see there are people around them and it, they film this in secret so you don't see the face and they take off the headscarf. Mm -hmm. Or they don't wear it in the in, in public transport and they get attacked by other women for not wearing modest clothes. Yeah. Um, well, but it takes a lot. They know the consequences. I think Iran is quite special though because they have a lot of like people with Western values and, yeah. um, some of my Iranian friends, they've shown me videos of say a religious zealot shouting at a girl for not wearing a headscarf, but yeah. instead of her being beaten, he gets beaten. And you see a lot of like a fight back. Yeah, yeah. You see the this. Yeah. this uh, Iran has a special history. You're right about this. Yeah. Um, that's the thing. It's just the religious tyranny, theocracy that yeah. uh, binds the different countries together. Yeah. It's what ruined the country, actually, when you look at it. It's a yeah, main I factor. Still, it's a main I'm factor. I'm quite optimistic about Iran somehow. I think I, don't you know, think I meet so. a lot of Iranians and they always seem super Western. That's, you know, they have a very uh, old uh, culture, you know, mm. and it's like a lot of the liberalism, so-called liberalism in Islam or open-mindedness is actually from Persia. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at a lot of the poets, philosophers, uh, it's, it was a hub, you know, for, for intellectuals. Mm -hmm. So you see this also, you know, generations on that they are very unique in that, in that way. You cannot compare them to, to places like, I don't know, Saudi Arabia. They're, they're uh, shepherds, Saudi Arabians, when you look at it, you know, Desert shepherds. People may not like to hear this, but you cannot compare it to the class of the Iranians, yeah. the Persians, I would say, because they have a longer, richer culture and, uh, you know, a discourse, an open discourse. And you have, of course, the religious idiots now for a long time who have taken over, but I don't see this changing anytime soon. Yeah, I, I've heard it described that in Islam, there's two like main, uh, I, I, I'm Sex, not smart yeah. enough to, You have yeah. like Sunni not, and Shias. Um, it's like when you have Catholics and Protestants, you have yeah. different sects. It um, depends on how they see what happened after Muhammad's death. That's where the fight comes. Mm -hmm. Like who should rule, uh, who should take over, be the carrier of the, of the faith. And the Sunnis say uh, Abu Bakr, Muhammad's best friend, and Shia say, no, Ali, you know. So it's like, uh, this is where one of the fight comes from. And guess who gets blamed in the end? Jews. Women. Oh, Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. And a Jewish woman who was actually blamed for poisoning um, Muhammad, ah. you know. So it's like being a woman and Jewish, that's a crime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah I, I don't want to get too much into religious history because i'm so ignorant that no uh, i would just lose myself about but talking um talking about porn yeah that's um it i'm sure there are people out there who are watching it and exploring it uh, also in iran i'm sure of it you know yeah I've, I've always wondered about the kind of muslim fetish in porn and my theory is that it's Westerners watching, fetishizing Muslim, like dress and Muslim women. 
Whereas I would guess that Muslims yeah. are watching Western porn because it's like the opposite. It's um, I would say it's a mix. I think I think there is also this obsession with blonde women that they yeah. have. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. I've noticed why, that. <laughs> you see that a lot of you know uh, what is it called um, dark haired women dye their hair blonde in order to please their husband. Like even if you look at Iran or, you know, Arab countries, you see a lot of women dyeing their hair. Um, it's because of the men usually, you know, because they are attracted to the blue eyed, you know, the Aryan, I would even say, mm-hmm. look, it's really bad. But you also have those Muslim guys who are also attracted or turned on by a woman who he's not meant to, who she's meant to see as a sister, you know, because the white woman, he does not respect She's a whore, according to his mm. beliefs, and the Muslim woman is a sister. So it's like he shouldn't see her, but he's still curious. You yeah. know, it's like it's a bit of both, I would say, in this case. Yeah, it's it's such a mind fuck, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's just. But that's the way they. This is like literally why I tell you it's better to be an atheist. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. I, I I like a lot of religious texts, though. I, I find them comforting. I find that I learn a lot about more complex aspects of being human um, mm. that you don't get in any other type of education. I think there's a lot of good in there. I just think the indoctrination, the old-fashioned rules, the, mm. how it doesn't fit with modern culture and modern values is what lets it down really yeah and i think the, it goes hand in hand yeah like if so long as it respects individuality then i'm okay with religion but when it doesn't and it wants everybody to conform to the same scriptures i think that's when it becomes a problem for me i think that's the whole basis that there is no individuality and you're just sheep i just i know i know what you're what you're trying to say um i just feel like it's our first like, a, like, you know, when a baby t- tries to talk, it's mm-hmm. like the first attempt at talking, you know, and that's our first attempt at baby talking the big questions of life. And now we know better, you know, it's like our okay. first attempt was embarrassing and <laughs> some people might admire it, um, but it's, it's very, I don't know, it's our, it was the first attempt at philosophy. And it wasn't a very good one either. I'm not so sure. Like every culture around the world created religion. Um, and maybe we need it somehow. Maybe there's something in our brains that needs something to believe in, religion or otherwise. So I'm, I'm not so mm. sure that not having any religion, I mean, it's good for some people. It's fine for me. Yeah. But I, I feel that maybe... It's not good for everybody. I just feel like it's accepting things the way they are because people who are not smarter than you tells you it is. It's like the comfort of accepting things but not questioning them, you know? And I cannot live my life that way. Uh, I'd rather say I don't know than claim I know when I don't mm-hmm. know, you know? Uh, and it's this dishonesty and yeah. attempt to, to hijack tr- the, the truth um science is like okay you know what this is the fact we don't know if things don't work out we will try again you see it with the covid vaccines first the time wrong it's the, it's the yeah. honesty you know that's missing that's and, the thing yeah you see even with the vaccines that science is being treated more like a religion than like just following a scientific method like it's supposed to be just a process to find out the truth but instead and this of is doing what it that we're like calling it the science and no, treating no. it like a strange religion. It's very <laughs> odd. Some people may see it this way, but in reality, you know, uh, that's what it is. You know, when things are not right, okay, you fail, you try again. You know, it's not, you don't claim, you know. What does the data say? But religion doesn't have this, you know. It just mm-hmm. claims to know and it attempts to control your life. And... Um, it's very tribalistic, you know, when we look at it, we all come, we're just cavemen, you know, and women in the end, we didn't develop that much. And 
people have similar ideas everywhere. You know, you kind of reinvent everything. It's just like people, yeah. when you're living in the dark, you don't have light, you don't have food that much, you're hungry, your fears, people believe that the rain was a message from God or the God rain or the fire, you know, and these noises. So it's sort of, instead of, I don't know why people would think it was some special message. It's God. But if people want to believe it's, it, it's somebody else's responsibility to take care of them instead mm -hmm. of just accepting it's the rain, it's the sun. Okay. Why would I be afraid? You know, but, uh, you see this in the maze runner, you know, the scene where there is the, in the, in the, in the, so in the, uh, in the maze, you hear the monsters and the people are afraid yeah. and only one attempts to explore and leave. And the other guys are like, yeah, but what if it kills you? What if this and what if that? So that's for me. The if you watch this one scene with the Maze Runner, I, that's I, religion I'm back summed to up. The film. Oh. It's summed up because people are afraid to explore more and tries to control what others, you know, should believe in. Yeah, and it comes a lot to porn too. You know, a lot of the anti-porn people out there. You know, it also has there. There are religious organizations. I don't know a single uh, religious organization that is pro porn. They're all against porn. They're all against individuality because they want to control us. So I know one. You know one that is pro porn. Uh, okay, tell me. So tell me. So and, there was, uh, they have a gay yeah. pastor. They are not included. But bear with me. <laughs> bear with me. There's. Um, I know two actually. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I, but I know one that's definitely pro porn. Um, okay. It, I don't know if you remember, but about six, about four years ago, five years ago, there were a lot of Russian models in the porn industry. Yeah. And yeah, they true. were in, they were part of this yoga organization, this yoga religion. Okay. It was a kind of cult where okay. in order to, so when you join the religion, there's three levels. And okay. when you get to the top level, you get to marry him and be his husband. Oh my God. And he was Holy filming shit. orgies to raise money for his religion. And he was sending the girls to Europe to work wow, in porn to make money for him. Yeah. Wow, that's really, that's, that doesn't count as a religion. To me. That's a cult. That's <laughs> that doesn't a cult. count. <laughs> that cult doesn't count. Religion. <laughs> It's, it, it, it's more of a cult. It's like Scientology, uh, you know. Um, cults are always sexual. Yeah, it's, the thing is, that's so sexual. weird, really. And this is why. So, what happened to this guy? Um, they so some. I might get the story a bit wrong, but yeah. they were persecuted for their religion. They were <laughs> living in Bulgaria at one point, and yeah. somebody tried to leave the cult. Yeah, but they wouldn't give her her child back. Oh my God. Um, wow. That is so, so fucked up. He was sent to prison for, um, kidnapping. I don't know if there were other crimes as well. Wow. But, that's so strange. Yeah. Yeah. That's really strange. I just charged my phone in the mean, meantime, but that's, that's okay. really crazy. So that's why, so basically this guy doesn't exist anymore, right? Or is this still He's going in on? prison in Russia and the models, um, some of them, you still yeah. see them saying, like, I don't yeah. know what they're saying because they're doing these, like, hour-long messages in Russian on YouTube. With, oh, wow. Yeah, it's really, I don't know what they're saying. So but he that's writes where them really it, yeah. long scripts to write and they have to, like, campaign for his freedom on YouTube. I mean, this is so strange. I mean, yeah. that's where it came from. Because I was wondering a couple of years ago, yeah, there was this like wave of Russian porn models. And I was. Who were, had incredible bodies because of his yoga yeah. training. It, his, <laughs> the diet and, he put them on was insane. And the fitness yeah. regime he put them on was unbelievable. Yeah. He did a good how, job with them. How many were there actually? Um, again, I don't remember exactly, but there were roughly 10 in each level. Um, so I think there were about 10, maybe a few more, maybe a few less. Um, Do you know anyone? <laughs> I know them all. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> there, was, there was a point on my old website where I was yeah. like, when we found out about the cult and I was 
I looked on my site and I was like, oh my God, are my site's just all cult members for the last six months. Oh, shit. It was, yeah, it was. But wow. they were, some of them are friends as well. Some of them are friends. Yeah, but it's really strange. Like, wow, well, it's like, that's an experience, yeah. literally, like to find yourself in the middle of a cult and you're taken advantage of, or maybe you enjoy it for the money and you have a good life, but still it's like... I, yeah, yeah, I don't know how, like, I don't know if you've seen, I don't know if there's something similar in Islam or if you've seen it with Christians, but you get these kind of born again Christians where they, oh dis- God, con- yeah. where they discover religion later in life. Oh, one of those. And they're okay. often more devout. And I think if you do that, you've often got something missing in your life. Or, um, maybe you've had some tragedy or some accident and you find God. And I think maybe these yoga girls, they just have something missing in their life. You so, find this with terrorists, actually. It's a phenomenon yeah. that they, you know, drink like crazy, have sex with everyone and then party and, you know, they were not religious. And then there is a moment where they become really religious and worse, actually. The most uh, religious. Yeah, the most religious. And it's the hypocrisy, but still it's like they've all, all of a sudden, you know, like devout. And that's when you should start getting suspicious and start reporting mm-hmm. people when you have this kind of uh, change in character. Um, because... A lot of, you know, when you look at certain cases, this is the, the typical pattern. I'm not saying that the Russian models will end up like this. <laughs> but, I'm sure they're not. <laughs> but yeah, they turned them out. Yeah, that's really strange. I mean, you do know it's a very I'd, interesting I'd love to have encounter. one of them on to tell us about it. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, I understand. Yeah. It's identity, yeah. And, yeah. Well, then they were all over the newspapers, so it was, it was okay. very public. Yeah. Maybe they just don't want to talk about it and want yeah, to close I think the chapter. I don't think any of them have left, or if they have, they're not. Yeah, I don't think anyone's spoken out about it yet. Oh, okay. But so. it, what a strange... Sometimes, you know, I'm like, I try to keep, you know, uh, I read the news and know what's going on in the industry, but such things I miss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I only found out because I posted something on Twitter and then someone started linking to articles below the girl's photo and was like, what is this? Yeah. What the hell? Oh my God. Yeah. You need to send me these links. <laughs> I will, I will. <laughs> as soon as we will send the link. No, very interesting conversation. I mean, we went from Afghanistan childhood to masturbation and um, yeah, what I, I see th- now and Russian I think we did a lot cult. of that. It was like, <laughs> I wanted to just talk about, I guess, sexuality from your perspective as you know, growing up from that background. I think that I think we achieved that. So let's wrap up, I guess. Yeah. So do you want to tell us where people can find you? Yeah, of course. Um, you can find me on www.yasmina.eu. That's like my main uh, website, but it's a not content website. It's just where you find everything, the links, and. Um, or linked tree slash Yasmina, or my Instagram is uh, yasmina.eu, Twitter is underscore EU, because I wasn't able to have a dot. <laughs> yeah. And before it was something else, and then I had to change it because I, I lost my account because of the hate, you know, my, my Instagram account was blocked. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but that's where you can find me. And if you, my OnlyFans is Yasmina triple X. Cool. So that's where you can find me and... Um, yeah, or just if this is going on Instagram or anywhere, just write in the comments and uh, we will yeah, we will answer. It's going everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put your links yes. in anyway. So. Oh, this will and be yeah. a, this will be. I'm curious about the clips you're gonna take out of this video. It's gonna be funny. Me too. I've got to aim for one minute clips, so it's it's not always easy. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I really love it. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And if you want to. You know, check out Yasmina's links if you want to see more of her. Um, if you have questions um, about anything we've talked about, just feel free to message in comments or write in. Um, check mctommy.com if you want to see some of my porn or articles. Um, and just remember to subscribe, rate it five stars, hit the like button, whatever you need to do. And um, thanks for listening. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, we're done. <laughs>